Welcome to Unbiased Science, where we bring scientific method to the madness. I'm your co-host, Dr. Jessica Steyer. And I'm your other co-host, Dr. Andrea Love. And we are so excited to record our very first episode today. So Andrea, I feel like we need to do just a little bit of an intro icebreaker for folks who don't know who we are. Um, This is a surprise for Andrea. Um, So let's just dive in. And I know we have a lot of content that we want to get to today, um, but I thought it'd be good to just kick off with three quick questions just to introduce ourselves to everyone. So good. (laughs) Is that okay? (laughs) Yes. Let's do it. All right. So, Andrea, let's just start. Um, Where are you from and where do you live now? Oh, so I've been all over the place, but I grew up in eastern Connecticut, um, a town called Norwich, which is near, very near the sub base, the Groton sub base. Uh, my dad was in the Navy, so that's how we ended up there when I was a kid. Uh, I lived there for until college and then moved to Long Island, where I spent a few years there at Stony Brook for undergrad and then migrated to New York City for a long time, including grad school. And now I'm finally in the Philadelphia suburbs. Andrew, I didn't know your dad was in the Navy. That's so cool. Yeah, uh, he was uh, <laughs> He was a naval commander on nuclear submarines during the Cold War. So Holy cow. Wow. <laughs> uh, that's an interesting little anecdote. Um, okay, so I am from Brooklyn originally, Brooklyn, New York, specifically South Brooklyn. Uh, if you know, you know. Uh, <laughs> and like Andrea, I lived on Long Island for a bit. Um, we actually met at Stony Brook University, so that was over a decade ago. We both did our undergrad at Stony. Um, I also did my master's there and then uh, also moved to the city when I was doing my doctorate um, at CUNY Graduate Center. And now I made the the exodus down to Florida. So I live in South Florida, specifically in Jupiter. um, And it's definitely a big uh, change of scenery, but loving it, loving it here. Can I just say that I feel super old realizing how long ago we were actually in college together? I know. I know. I try not to think about it too much. Um, And I also feel old because I feel like, you know, this, the exodus down to Florida, (laughs) people usually do that when they're (laughs) in their 60s or 70s. So that's not helping either. Um, Okay. Next question. I know we're, we're tight on time here. So what do you do full time? Ah, that's an interesting question. Um, So I work full time for a biotech company um, where I started out as an application scientist. And basically what that means is I serve as uh, an assay development and assay optimization expertise. Um, So the company make technology that that researchers use for cancer research, immunology research, vaccine research, stem cell research, gene therapy, um, the whole gamut of different types of biomedical sciences. And so I serve as a subject matter expert um, to help train them, to help design their experiments, to help them analyze data, to help conduct experiments. Um, and so it it means that I travel around to a lot of different labs uh, around the area, working with them to design and execute different types of research. That is so badass. I still pinch myself that I get to do this with you. Um, Okay, I'll give my little uh, brief intro as well. So I am the co-founder and CEO of Vital Statistics Consulting. Uh, We are a woman-owned small business. We specialize in the design of health health policy, health program evaluations, um, as well as advanced analytics. Um, my background is in public health uh, with an emphasis in health policy and management. Um, I'm also an applied biostatistician. And I think what's so cool about this podcast, and Andrea, we've said this so many times, is that um, you know I'm coming from the population health perspective, so macro level, and Andrea brings the immunology, microbiology perspective. So it's a little bit of macro and micro. So super com- comprehensive perspectives, uh, we hope. We hope that everyone agrees. <laughs> <laughs> with that. And um, I love that you keep saying you're impressed by me, yet you're a CEO and founder of a public health consulting firm. So oh my let's just give credit where it's due. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. And, and, you know, this is, uh, 
this is a passion project for us, Andrea, obviously. I know you know that, but we're both working full time. And this is just something that we've talked about for a while. And really, I can't believe it's actually happening. I have goosebumps. (laughs) Um, And that actually brings me to my final question before we dive into today's topic. Um, it really briefly, why is this so important to you? Doing this uh, <laughs> So many reasons, but I'll try and distill it down. So since even high school, I've been a huge proponent of bringing science to the masses, so to speak. Um, you know, I saw firsthand a lot of the detrimental effects of the lack of access to education. Um, you know, I was from, you know, a relatively middle class family, but, um, you know, my high school sourced from very small rural towns in the area. And so there's a lot of people that just don't have access to the same sort of resources. And that ultimately is reflected in education and literacy. And so as, you know, I've moved in my career in science, my expertise has grown, but, you know, the general public's hasn't. And so I think for me, it's really critical that we're able to serve as a resource for people where they can actually access credible information with regard to science and be able to trust it. Um, Misinformation and disinformation is just far too rampant. And I think that we have an obligation as experts to serve in that capacity. Well, wow, that was well said. Um, Can I just cheat and say, you know, what she said? Um, Yes. (laughs) No, I agree with all of that. And I will just add two words, Uh, mom groups. (laughs) People people may not know, but I'm a mom. I have two young kids and I'm a part of all these social media mom groups. And I am just blown away, flabbergasted by the amount of misinformation that is rampant on there. And and actually, Andrea, if, if I'm remembering correctly, you know, we talked about doing this podcast well before COVID. Yes. Um, I think it was just in general vaccines and the misinformation around vaccines that I was seeing in these groups um, and that I know you're, you're seeing in general on social media. And that really inspired us to, to, um, to put out the science yes. and really dispel so many of these uh, myths. So anyway, that's who we are. And obviously, needless to say, we're super excited about this and are so grateful that you, you all are tuning in and, and listening in with us. So let's just go for it, Andrea. Let, let's get to the to the meat of today's episode. Let's do it. All right. So with the race to find a vaccine for COVID-19 underway, we thought it was only appropriate that we launch the pod with a discussion about this extremely hot topic. So today's question is, how will the COVID-19 vaccine work if preliminary evidence shows that the antibodies people develop after getting sick only last a few months? Now, to set the stage here, um, the reason we chose this topic was because there were several recent studies that have been reporting a reduction in antibody levels in COVID-19 patients. Um, Typically, they're seeing this by three months post-infection. Um, And so there was a study in the New England Journal of Medicine that reported a decline in antibodies in convalescent patients, a study in Nature Medicine in a very small group of individuals, and also another one that was actually a preprint. And a preprint means it hasn't been peer-reviewed yet. So um, ultimately, though, these studies, as you would expect, garnered a lot of press coverage, uh, reporting these very buzzworthy headlines saying that, you know, immunity is waning, vaccines won't be effective. And so we really decided that we wanted to focus on this, especially what that might mean with regard to an infective vaccine. Um, So so can I just say one thing, Andrea, I feel like, you know, you just made a really important point about these studies being preprint and not peer reviewed. And I feel like we're living in such a a crazy time right now, you know, in, in the middle of a pandemic, everyone is just pushing out all of these studies. And what people don't realize is that usually, you know, that peer review process is really extensive. And you have experts in the field really critically evaluating research before it's put out for public consumption. And, and right now that's, that's really not happening (laughs) because we we all are, you know, racing for more information on COVID. So sorry. Yeah, no, it's a great point. And, you know, the peer review process is something that, you know, I've gone through routinely. I actually just had a paper that's been in peer review for about six months just to get published. Um, and, you know, it's it's a way to find these holes in studies or, or deficiencies in experimental design that, you know, the conclusion might not be supported 
um, because of those sorts of flaws. And so mm -hmm. the peer review process is really critical to the scientific integrity. But at the same time, we, we want to also get this information out as quickly as possible so we can cross pollinate other researchers. So it's a bit of a pro con there right, right. now. Right. Um, so in the interest of total transparency, I've taken, well, in my undergrad career, I took one course in immunology and I did not do well in it. So <laughs> can you dive in and, and get us going with a little primer on the yeah, immune system? <laughs> definitely. So this is very, very, very high level. Um, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty in this episode here, but I do want to make a couple of really important distinctions. So the immune system is a complex network of organs, of cell types, of of tissues and vessels. Um, ultimately, what they're used for is to patrol uh, our bodies, uh, identify foreign invaders or injuries. Um, so the immune system participates in wound healing, whether it's from a surgery or from a cut or some other type of tissue injury. Um, and, and what these immune cells do is they identify foreign invaders or things that shouldn't be happening in the body, and they um, implement a call to action. And so Broadly speaking, we have two branches of the immune system. We have one branch called the innate immune system and one branch versus called the adaptive immune system. And as you might expect from the two words, uh, innate is, is inherent. It's always there. It is your kind of generic, nonspecific, um, immediate response. Your adaptive immunity, which is really what's involved in, in vaccination, um, is, as you would expect, it's, it adapts. So it's specific to a, a specific invader, a specific pathogen or disease. Um, it takes time. It has to adapt. Um, but ultimately, that is the one that participates in what we're going to call immunity, long-term immunity, or memory immunity. Um, the innate immune system is really this initial responder. So say, um, you know, you, you uh, cut yourself and some bacteria get into that cut. The innate immune cells are always in your body and they're always ready to attack. And when they recognize these these non-self pieces, these pieces of bacteria, these pieces of virus, or these pieces of other um, pathogens, they will immediately mount a response and try and eliminate the infection before it can even take root. Um, at the same time that they're doing that, they're also going to sound the alarm and they're going to signal to the cells in the adaptive side to come to the site of infection and help them fend them off. Um, so the innate immune cells are always there. They're, they're this kind of general inflammatory response, but they serve to activate the adaptive immune system. Now, the adaptive immune system is the important one that we're going to discuss here. Not that they're both not important, but in the context of vaccination, uh, the adaptive immune system is the important portion. So the adaptive immune system is composed of two main classes of cells, the B cells and the T cells. Uh, the B cells are the adaptive immune cells that produce antibodies. Um, and the T cells are the adaptive immune cells that are, we call them cytotoxic killer cells killer T cells or helper T cells. These ones um, establish the branch of long-term immunity called cell-mediated immunity. So our antibody response from the B cells and our cell-mediated immunity from the T cells participate together to establish this long-term immunity uh, in response to infection. Uh, Andrea, I just want to jump in and say that I wish I had you as a TA. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt your flow. I'm just sitting here like nodding along with everything that you're saying. This is really, really interesting stuff. Um, and obviously, so you're, you're going to walk us through um, how this relates to, you know, the differences between getting the infection, you know, natural infection versus getting the vaccine and, and differences in immune response. And okay, I'll stop talking. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, so the, the early studies that, um, you know, are focusing on, on do we have immunity after we recover from COVID-19 or focusing on what we call serum antibodies. And those, so these are antibodies. These are, these are little bits of protein that the B cells produce and secrete in large amounts in response to an infection. Um, and these take time to produce. So basically what happen, happens is 
the B cells recognize these components of the virus in this case uh, for SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID. And they start to produce these very specific proteins that recognize pieces of the virus uh, and bind to it. And when they bind to it, the hope is that the binding of these proteins from the B cells in, inhibits the ability of the virus to infect us. These are what we call neutralizing antibodies. These are ultimately what would prevent that virus from infecting us in the future. Um, so we have different classes of these antibodies. So the ones that are are critical for this long-term immunity in the case of COVID are going to be what we call IgG. So it's just a particular category of these antibodies. And this is what these antibody tests are also looking for. They're looking for blood levels of these IgG antibodies. So what typically happens is over the course of the infection, initially you're not going to have any antibodies because the innate immune system is responding, the virus is reproducing, and it's making you sick. And over time, it's usually within the first week or two, these IgG proteins, these antibodies start to get produced by your B cells. And these are going to peak um, like two to three weeks after your infection. And that's going to often be a marker of what we call immunity. What ends up happening after that, though, is that these levels start to kind of drop off as the B cells start to go into a resting period. And so it's not at all unexpected that we actually do see what they're referring to as waning or declining antibody levels. You don't want your antibodies to be constantly high uh, in your blood all the time when you're not physically ill. But in the same process, you're also producing memory B cells, essentially, um, that when you encounter that virus again, they're going to be able to spike and produce huge amounts of that IgG antibody um, after a second um, interaction or challenge with that virus. So the fact that we're actually losing levels of antibodies in these patients is not a cause for alarm. In fact, three months after infection is quite a long time. And the fact that we're actually seeing antibodies still in the blood that at that long is actually a, a good sign for potential long-term antibody immunity. So Andrea, can I jump in with just a couple of questions that I, you know, I know people have. Um, mm -hmm. So obviously, we, some people are getting the antibody tests, right? Right. So what is, you know, the the earliest, the latest, what's the time frame that someone should be getting the antibody test to detect antibodies? And just to confirm, they're looking for that IgG that you were talking about, right? Yeah. So there's an earlier antibody that's produced called IgM. That's your, that's going to be about seven days after the start of infection. Um, but that one tapers off really quickly. So most of the commercially available ana antibody tests are looking for the IgG. Um, that one's going to start to come up um, between the seven to 14 days. So one to two weeks after you're infected. And that'll persist for, you know, in these studies, several months in theory. Um, but the goal would ultimately be if you suspect that you are infected, maybe you had a positive COVID test, uh, diagnostic test, um, that maybe you want to consider getting an antibody test um, two to four weeks after that. Um, now, again, the antibody test is not a, a um, you know, for sure you're immune. It just means that your body has mounted a response against the virus. And can we give the disclaimer uh, that, you know, if you do test positive for antibodies, that that doesn't necessarily mean that you are, you know, protected from reinfection. It, it should not. We don't fully understand the immune response to to COVID just yet. Um, I don't need to tell you. I know you know this better than I do, um, but we're obviously learning more um, every single day. So it's important that if you do get that positive test, that you're not changing your behavior. You know, it doesn't mean that you should go out without wearing a mask or have parties or anything like that. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the other important thing is that these antibody levels, the reason that all these studies are focusing on these antibody levels in the context of immunity is that antibodies or neutralizing antibodies, um, which would serve to neutralize the virus, are much easier to test for than the other branch of the adaptive immune response, which is the cell-mediated immunity. Testing for that is a much more complicated process. It's not going to be one of these rapid tests that you can do, you know, in the doctor's office. It involves 
um, much more complicated parameters that we have that we would have to do in the lab per se. Um, and so using antibody levels as a quick gauge or an early gauge for um, our people establishing an immunity, a memory immunity, um, is a good way to gauge how long this might last for, but it's not the only piece of the puzzle. The cell median immunity, which is your memory T cells, are critical to um, being able to have this long-term immunity, whether it's through natural infection because you got sick from COVID or it's through a vaccine itself. You know, I think the thing that has some people freaked out is that there have been a couple of confirmed cases of reinfection, right? Um, I think, uh, and, and please step in here if I'm saying anything that's incorrect. I think there was one case, was it Hong Kong, um, where there was a man who had COVID. He um, he then got it again, but his second infection was super mild. I don't even think he was symptomatic. Um, and then I believe there was another confirmed case of reinfection in the United States um, in a woman. And unfortunately, in her case, her second round of infection was actually worse than the first. Um Sorry. Yeah. So one of the, the things to keep in mind is that the immune system is unique for every individual. And so you have this spectrum of immune responses and ultimately disease severity as well. So disease, disease severity is partially the pathogen itself and the damage it does to your body, but also how your immune system reacts to it. And so some of these, um, again, I want to I wanna have the caveat that these are rare and infrequent cases of reinfection, um, are, are due predominantly because that initial immune response was not strong enough to um, elicit this, this potent memory immunity. Um, however, we're seeing since his second case was more mild, then it actually did a decent job of at least moderating um, the illness the second time. With the, the woman that had a uh, more severe case, um, you know, that is very likely because the initial immune response was not sufficient, um, that possibly her infection was cleared maybe by components of the innate immune system, which are nonspecific and they're kind of generic, but they often do a good job of clearing relatively mild infections so that once she got infected with a higher viral load or something like that, she actually got a very severe illness because she wasn't uh, primed. She wasn't equipped to handle that second infection. Okay, that's really interesting. And also a very good point that these are very, very rare cases of reinfection. I think there have been some reports that were um, not confirmed, and those might be issues with testing, false positive, false negative, all that stuff. Um, so just want to confirm that right now we only have a couple of confirmed cases of reinfection. Right, right. Absolutely. Okay, so I think you were leading us down a path of, you know, there's so much concern people are saying, okay, so let's say, you know, we're saying immunity might wane after right. a few months, or let's say reinfection, let's say it's possible. How, you know, should we be confident that a vaccine would actually get us long term immunity? Yeah, it's a great question. So typically, what a vaccine is doing, and we're going to, you know, focus on this in more detail later, but vaccines are mimicking a natural infection. So what they're doing is they're pretending they're masquerading as the actual virus in this case, and they are triggering that, that adaptive immune response. And so the most effective vaccines are going to be the ones that uh, initiate both that antibody immunity and the cell mediated immunity. So you need the B cells and the T cells in order to have a really effective immune response. Um, and so different viruses are made up of different pathogen components. So we've heard some about weakened viruses or killed viruses. And there's also what we call subunit vaccines, which are little components of the virus, like the DNA or the RNA. Um, these ones are all going to elicit slightly different immune responses because the body reacts differently depending on what it encounters. Um, but ultimately, the goal of the vaccine is to eliminate the risks of a natural infection. So death and, and severe um, long-term potential uh, health effects, but give you that memory immunity. So when you do encounter the virus in real life, you'll have that immunity. So the goal of a uh, an effective vaccine is going to elicit that potent 
neutralizing antibody response. So, and your B cells are producing those IgG antibodies and they're going to, um, increase in higher numbers when you're exposed to the virus, then you're going to have a spike of those IgG levels, but you're also going to have your helper and your cytotoxic T cells that are involved. So these early studies that are looking at these antibody levels and are, you know, sounding the alarm and saying, hey, these antibodies are decreasing, that's to be expected. So that's not um, that's not a concern with regard to the immunology of infection. You would expect the antibodies would peak and then they're going to taper off. And the fact that we're actually able to still detect them several months out is actually a good sign. It may very well mean that we might have pretty long-term immunity um, from the virus itself, but also with regard to a vaccine. Um, recent, more recent studies have actually shown, uh, now we're looking more into these T-cell responses, that... Um, a new study in Cell actually demonstrated that these people that recovered, um, they studied, uh, it was a small group, but, but a pretty robust study, um, that 70% of these people that recovered had helper uh, killer T cells. So these are T cells that would immediately recognize the virus and neutralize it without any additional need from other pieces of the immune system. And 100% of them actually had specific memory helper T cells. So this actually is really good news because what this means is that these people that are getting naturally infected are mounting both this uh, B cell antibody immune response and also this T cell immune response. Uh, and what this could mean for a vaccine is that the these vaccine candidates may actually initiate a similar response, which taken together will ultimately provide that long-term immunity. Well, that is music to my ears. <laughs> so, you know, a, a question that I that I keep seeing is, you know, with the flu shot, and we we talked about this. We're going to have at least one other episode completely dedicated to the flu and the flu vaccine. Um, but with the flu shot, we have to get a, a shot every year, right? Do yeah. you think that that's going to be the case with COVID? So, you know, it's really hard to say right now, just because we haven't even been in a year of the actual infection yet. So, it's really hard hard to say what's going to happen essentially once we get through what, you know, what you can say a first calendar cycle of the virus. Um, however, the fact that we're having such a high antibody response that persists for so many months, it may be that we don't necessarily need an annual vaccine. One of the reasons we need an annual flu shot is because the flu virus is very different from the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It mutates extremely rapidly. So by the time the next flu season comes along, the flu viruses that you encountered last year are not even the same anymore. And so you actually have to revaccinate because they're new flu viruses. Um, SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19, is not in that, uh, it doesn't mutate that quickly uh, like influenza viruses. And so the main reason we might need a vaccine more frequently would not be because of the mutation, but just because, be because immunity starts to decline. And again, it's too soon, I think, to know that. Um, a couple of scenarios I've seen are that we either get a booster in the beginning, like we do with several other vaccines like hepatitis B and, and hepatitis A and even MMR, um, where you get a series in, in the beginning. So you get um, one or two maybe initially, and then you get a third, maybe six months down the line. And that may actually be sufficient for more long-term immunity. Um, it could be something where we have to get an annual vaccine, or it might be something like your tetanus where you only need a booster every five, 10 years or so. Um, it's too soon to tell, but the early data is promising that uh, eventually we will have an effective vaccine for this virus. Okay, so can we just recap here for a second? So yeah. even though you know we we've seen that it, I don't, antibodies may wane, or we, we don't fully understand the immune response, and it's possible we've seen in a couple of cases that people can be re reinfected. Um, we do believe that a vaccine. Well, I don't want to say we believe. <laughs> I don't know what the proper wording is here, but there's evidence, early evidence that a vaccine would provide long-term immunity 
to to um, SARS-CoV-2, to COVID-19, right? Yep. Um, and that, you know, it's unclear because you're saying that it does not seem that this virus is mutating as, as quickly as, as other viruses, such as the flu, um, that we would necessarily need a vaccine every year. It's possible we might need a booster, but sort of TBD, you know? Where yes, we're absolutely, things. absolutely. Okay. And we're still figuring a lot of this out, um, you know, as we go because it's such a novel virus and because um, even in other related viruses in the coronavirus family, we we have yet to have a vaccine. So we don't know, you know, how that's going to evolve over time. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the other big differences, though, is that influenza has seasonality to it. So you have these cycles where you have peaks and valleys of flu cases. We don't see that for COVID-19. Um, it's been consistently prevalent uh, in all climates, in all geographies. Um, and so that would suggest that it, it very well might not behave like uh, influenza does. So, Andrea, you know, we got a ton of questions about um, some of these, you know, the specific vaccine trials, the one out of Oxford that was, you know, stopped and this and that. Um, I think we probably need a separate episode. Absolutely. Dive into those. Yep. Um, so guys, please be patient with us, but we don't want to rush that. Uh, there's a lot to, to dig into there, but we will address that. Okay. So I don't know if you want to get into this now, <laughs> Andrea, but obviously the question on everyone's mind is, you know, when are we going to have a vaccine? Do you want to comment on that now? Yeah. I mean, I think it definitely warrants a deeper dive at a later, uh, on a later episode, but I will say, um, you know, the latest stage vaccine candidates, meaning the ones that are furthest along in the in the testing pipeline for both safety and efficacy, are only starting their phase three trials. And phase three trials are when we enlist very large groups of people, um, thousands and thousands of individuals, volunteers. And we have uh, one group that's vaccinated with the candidate and one that's mock vaccinated, meaning they're just vaccinated with, with saline or salt water. And then you have to wait and see. You have to wait and see um, if there's differences in the numbers of people that get infected amongst the groups. And you also have to wait and see if there's differences in the severity of the disease amongst the groups. And that's not something that you can rush. You have to let nature take its course. You have to let them go about their daily lives and you have to monitor and, and um, observe, you know, the cases and the case severity. So realistically, um, you know, even if one of our frontline candidates right now is it pans out to be effective and safe. Um, you know, I wouldn't expect something until at least kind of, you know, early spring or mid next year. Um, and that, and that is, you know, aside from the fact that we have to mass manufacture those. So, you know, that, that initial availability is not going to be for everybody. Um, so it's going to take quite some time before we have mass vaccination, um, vaccine availability for everybody, and also, you know, what we're calling herd immunity, which I know is something that we want to really quickly touch on um, before we we start wrapping it up today. Um, yeah. So, uh -huh. Yeah. Sorry. So, so <laughs> yes, yeah. so, I was just gonna, I was just gonna hand it over to you, Jess, to, yeah. to really kind of do a bit of um, population um, health information about the goal of vaccination is not simply just to protect a single individual from illness. It's to establish this um, global kind of long-term immunity amongst the population. And, you know, Andrea, I'm excited that I can um, actually... <laughs> contribute to this episode now because uh you really this this is uh an, an incredible um you know i don't know tutorial introduction <laughs> whatever it is for for us um on uh immunology so thank you um but yeah so let's let's talk a little bit about herd immunity i i'm sure most people have have heard this term it's also known as community immunity uh which is a tongue twister and it's really a key concept in epidemiology and and the whole point is that, you know, only a proportion of a population needs to be immune to a virus, to an infectious agent for it to stop generating outbreaks and to make the spread of disease from person to person unlikely. Um, of course, the big question is, how do we get that immunity? Uh, and Andrew, you touched on this quite a bit. It can be through getting and overcoming natural infection, or it can be through vaccination. Right. Uh, so a very hot topic throughout this pandemic has been, how do we achieve herd immunity to COVID-19? And can we do so without a vaccine? Um, the really 
cool thing about herd immunity is that even individuals who are not vaccinated, uh, so let's say people who are immunocompromised or, or too young or, or whatever it might be, um, even those individuals who are not vaccinated are offered some protection because the, it, the disease has little opportunity to spread within the community. Um, so I often like to think about, you know, those dreaded group projects that we had in college where you have, uh, you know, one person who inevitably just does not carry their weight. Um, and yet, you know, they're still getting an A because you put in the work. Right. So that's sort right. of the concept of herd immunity. It's a um, great analogy. And I feel like it's also really important now uh, because, and I don't need to tell you this, but, you know, there's growing skepticism around vaccines and we're really yeah. concerned about vaccine uptake. So let's say we do all this work and immunologists like Andrea are working on this vaccine. It gets released to the public and who knows how many people will actually get it. Right. So typically, herd immunity is achieved when 70 to 90 percent of the population is immune. Again, that can be through natural infection um, or through vaccination. And I think it's also important to point out that even if herd immunity is achieved, it might not be uniform across the population. You know, right. we, we've seen that with things like measles, pertussis, you know, there are little, you know, micro epidemics and outbreaks in places where, let's say, vaccine uptake is very low. So that's that's important to, to point out as well. So um we achieve herd immunity when one infected person in a population generates less than one other secondary case on average. And that corresponds to R. R is the effective reproduction number. And we want to see that drop below one in the absence of interventions. Now, another thing that I'm sure people have heard of is R naught. It looks like if you're if you're reading it, it's R zero. It's R naught. And that's the reproduction number in the absence of control measures in a fully susceptible population. And again, that R naught may vary across populations. So there have been tons of studies and models trying to estimate the R naught for SARS-CoV-2. Um, typically, the accepted range is somewhere between 2.5 to 4. So that means that for every person who has, um, who's been infected with SARS-CoV-2, they infect on average 2.5 to 4 people, again, in the absence of prevention measures. So we're talking about, you know, if people aren't socially distancing, if they're not wearing masks. So everyone wants to know, you know, what is the proportion of individuals that we need to be immune to establish herd immunity? So there's a, a formula. So it's proportion of immune individuals equals one minus one divided by R naught. Um, so let's just kind of walk through a little calculation here. The study um, done in France that estimated the R naught to be three. So again, that's saying that for every one person who's infected, they on average are infecting three people in the absence of uh, preventative measures. So um, for that, when we plug into that little formula, one minus one divided by three, we come up uh, with 67%. So in France, based on an R naught of three, we're saying that the herd immunity threshold for SARS-CoV-2 is expected to require 67% population immunity. Now, Experts agree. So there, there's a range here, right? At the bare minimum, experts are agreeing um, that there's little evidence to suggest that the spread of COVID is going to stop naturally before at least 50% of the population has become immune. Now, what is that? How does that translate? So in the United States, for example, the cost of reaching herd immunity through natural infection in the absence of a vaccine would be very, very high, especially in the absence of really stringent uniform pre prevention strategies, and especially among those who are more susceptible uh, to severe illness. So let's use an optimistic herd immunity threshold of 50%. Um, in the United States, that would translate to between 500,000 and over 2 million deaths to establish uh, herd immunity through natural infection, again, in the absence of a vaccine. Um, 
That's a lot of deaths. Uh, that's yes. more than, than I'm comfortable with. Absolutely. Um, did, did you want to comment, Andrea? Um, yeah, I was just going to kind of summarize or distill down, um, you know, the, the population um, health kind of side of that. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, for everybody listening, basically what Jess is saying is that we can use as scientists a formula to estimate based on how quickly or avidly a pathogen spreads in a population to gauge how much of the population needs to be immune in order to stop the continued spread of that disease. So right now, you know, COVID is spreading like wildfire because we're all susceptible um, based on how quickly it spreads its reproduction value. We would need a minimum of 50% immune population. Um, Realistically, it's probably a little bit closer to that 67 or even 70%. Um, And so natural immunity is just not a viable option for us. There are too many fatalities and too many long-term consequences of people that even recover from this um, to even logically propose that as an option. And that's ultimately why we do need an effective vaccine. Um, Does that kind of sum it up, Jess? Thank you. Yes. And I think it's great that I try to distill what you're saying and you distill what I'm saying, (laughs) because I think we're both just so passionate about our fields that maybe, you know, we go a little deep and (laughs) definitely. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Just one other thing I'll add, and then I I think we should wrap up um, because we definitely threw a lot out there is that I think what's really unique about this virus, you know, obviously it's totally novel, um, is that it's it's so highly infectious. And, you know, maybe that's something we cover in another episode, but, you know, it's more infectious than the flu, for example. So mm-hmm. that makes it really difficult to contain and to manage. And I think it also makes herd immunity, um, you know, via nat- uh, via natural infection, very scary. You know, it's going to spread so rapidly. And, and we know that, um, you know, people die from this. And if they don't die, and this is the thing that frustrates me, you know, some people talk about this as a binary live versus die. Something that we'll definitely talk about at, at more length is, is that, you know, there's that spectrum, that gray area. There are the long haulers, people who are really sick for a very long time. And this thing affects so many different organ systems. And we don't even fully understand the long-term effects yet. Agreed. So- Agreed. I'm really scared about this whole, you know, let it r- let the virus run wild so we could ach- achieve herd immunity. That really freaks me out. Um, so I'm really hoping that we do get a vaccine um, safely um, yes. and as quickly as possible. Yeah, and I think I think this whole concept of letting a a, a disease run rampant, um, not even just in the case of COVID nineteen, but but really in any infectious disease that we can develop a vaccine for, um, is just uh, not well-placed logic. You know, vaccines are probably one of the biggest public health and medicine developments of of modern, you know, scientific era. And, um, you know, they prevent, you know, significant disease and death. And, and um, you know, I think here the big concern is we don't want to rush it too quickly. We want to make sure that it is, in fact, safe. It is, in fact, effective before we start um, distributing it. So it's certainly going to be a while before everybody's going to have access to a vaccine, Um, But at least right now, the data does suggest that just because the antibody levels uh, show a decline in some of these early studies that the media grabbed onto doesn't necessarily mean that we won't be able to develop a vaccine. Well, I think that's a good place to to end on that optimistic note. Uh, Do you want to close us out, Andrea? Sure. Um, (laughs) So thanks, everybody, for joining us today. We really hope you learned a thing or two. Um, In our next episode, we will do a deeper dive into the technology and principles of vaccines themselves and how they are able to safely establish immunity. Catch you next time on the pod, your trusted source for no-nonsense, Just science.